Okay, so one of the questions I've always had, and I'm not sure the answer to, is uh, why do I drive past other fueling stations, other gas stations, uh, and go and get shell gas? Uh, I, I think it's from uh, my early like Club SI forum days, uh, where, or maybe it was on Honda Tech, you remember the Honda Tech forum? I think it still exists, but I, I don't want to frequent that anymore. Uh, but on Honda Tech, there was always lots of um, lots of technical information. You know, and, you know, if you needed to fix something on your Civic or your Integra or your Prelude or something like that, you would go there. And uh, and I remember reading oil studies and gas studies uh, loosely. Uh, and uh, and a lot of it was the smart guy on the forum. You'd kind of follow what he said. And so. Years and years ago, I don't know what it was precisely, I don't even remember the article, but I'd made the decision that Shell V Power was the best gas uh, based on some of this statistical data that I'd, I'd, I'd perused, you know, back in my younger engineering days. And so I've been using that gas for my whole life. And so about, shoot, it was probably six months ago, uh, one of the marketing, marketing agencies for Shell uh, V Power reached out to me. Uh, and I guess they're reaching out to some, you know, uh, smaller influencers, if you will, or, or medium-sized influencers. So they reached out to me and asked if I wanted to uh, meet them at the BMW 50th anniversary, uh, 50th anniversary gathering at the BMW Car Club. I thought, oh, that would be cool. Uh, so I'll go up. Uh, I've never done anything with any kind of sponsor, uh, but uh, and I, I'm not sponsored by them. Uh, other than them inviting me to these these couple of events, uh, but but really meeting them to discuss the possibility of them, you know, being some sort of partner with me and and uh, and 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 talking about uh, you know maybe you know doing some more things with them to answer this question: Why do I drive past other gas stations and go and get get Shell gas? Why do I do that? And so this video you're going to watch uh, was them inviting me. The second invitation was to the Shell uh, Technology Center uh, in, uh, in Houston, Texas. So I got on a plane, flew to Houston, uh, and, uh, and met with, uh, met with uh, the, the, the Shell team uh, and got to spend some time with Serena, who is a, a Shell uh, chemical engineer, uh, and discussing why. So what you're going to watch in this video, I have some questions about octane, I have some questions about, um, about uh, lubrication and questions about additives. Uh, and, uh, and Serena, who is uh, not just a marketer, she's an actual you know, chemist, actual chemical engineer, and has actually worked on uh, some of the teams that have, have built and made this fuel over the years. Uh, and so I, I, I got some of the questions answered uh, about gas. What I'm hoping to answer in the future is, you know, I want to know from, from when it comes out of the ground, you know, and, and, and talk about, you know, crude and how is that refined and, and see the refining process and do some more, more digging and get it from the people who, who make the stuff. Uh, so I hope you uh, hope you find this interesting. Hope it starts to answer some of the questions. Uh, I know I'll have further questions going forward, uh, but this is a good start in me, you know, figuring out why I go to a Shell station uh, and not just you know stop at uh, you know stop at whatever you know local uh, you know big box store or gas station. Why I why I avoid that if I can. One of the things, obviously, when you do fuel development is that in order to talk about fuel with regular people, it's really hard to do that without showing them something. Because a lot of people don't really know or don't have any sort of understanding of how an engine works. So, so what we do is that we develop uh, tools like this is, a t this is a real engine, and what we did is that we split it in half, and for people to actually try and experience what it is like uh, to operate an engine depending on whether you have friction or no friction or control against friction. So frictional losses are very well known in the industry. This is something that everyone, you know, from motorsports to uh, like driving just regular cars always um, struggles with, you know, how do we minimize energy losses due to friction in an engine. You have very, very tight clearances, as you can see there. You know, you got a piston there that is right against, up against the cylinder wall, 
and there's metal against metal, you know. So, uh, and these things have to work, you know. We can move this handle, and you can see this side has a little bit more friction, right? And the lights represent like the four cycles of the gasoline engine, which is, you know, you got intake, you got compression, there you got power from combustion, and then the exhaust part. So, um, so basically, you know, the fuel is designed, uh, our Shelby Power Nitro Plus premium gasoline designed to protect against friction and also uh, minimize wear and uh, corrosion and gunk in the engine. So basically, what, what you have here is as the, as the piston goes, that, well, let's see, as the piston is coming up, you have a mixture in there that is being compressed, right? So the spark plug fires and you got combustion. That pushes the piston down, right? The piston is pushed down, that's your power stroke. Mm -hmm. And this happens at about close to 3,000 RPM, so revolutions per minute, real fast, right? So everything in there gets pretty hot. Uh, you got fuel combusting, you got parts moving, you have a lot going on in there. So obviously the OEMs designed these engines to provide the maximum uh, performance, right? Mm -hmm. But the moment that you have things like friction, wear in the engine, carbon deposits, that's going to impact the performance of that engine. So why would Shell, it's because it's cleaner, you're saying? Well, why would the, why would it? Yeah, the additive chemistry is such, imagine, imagine the additive chemistry working on the surfaces, oh. right? Oh yeah, that's night yeah. and day. Night and day. That's so working on, on the metallic surfaces. Other, right? So you have microfilms that are really formed, you know, on the cylinder wall mm -hmm. and covering the top part of the piston where the piston rings are and I'm going to show you a piston inside. <laughs> so that, it's like it's like adding a cream to your hands, right? Mm -hmm. You say, oh, my hands are really rough right, and you put this cream on and then you feel, oh, smooth, right? Yeah. So it's exactly that. Because, it's, be be because it well. theoretically there, there shouldn't be oil in the cylinder. That's right. Right now, as an engine gets older, you get the, oh, you got when you start to have blow by or you have right. oil, um, you're burning oil, they would say. So right. there shouldn't so be. The oil is down below here. So oil shouldn't make it past the, the, the gas, the piston ring, yes. right? theoretically, yes. in a well functioning so, engine. Yes. So the top piston ring is always defined as being, uh, as being starved of oil. So the oil remains down below. The oil is there to cool things, right? And also to lubricate. But. It never, it should never get into the combustion chamber. Because yeah. if you get oil in the combust, well, you know, you yeah. get oil in the combustion chamber, you're going to be burning oil. Sure. Alongside your gas. And so the additive to the fuel helps aid in lubrication of the cylinder wall where oil shouldn't be. Right. You can, you can view and it that And that's why way. It, you yes. can feel a difference while we're turning. Exactly. Got it. Got it. Exactly. So this one is a cool one, and you may want to get your cameras ready because uh, I'm going to show you. This is a BMW engine. And then you can see inside. So again, you know, we split this engine in half and you can see here, you know, the array of uh, cylinders and the pistons. This is a direct injected engine. So you will see uh, the injectors are going to be sending the fuel directly inside the combustion chamber. So I don't know how much you know about the difference between a poor fuel injected engine and a direct injected engine. Can you explain that to in, me? In a poor fuel injected engine, the fuel goes inside the inlet port and it mixes with the air there, and then it goes into the combustion chamber as a mixture of air and fuel, right? Mm -hmm. In a direct injected engine, the fuel goes through. You inject the air into the combustion chamber and inject the fuel directly inside the combustion chamber. So the mixture forms in the combustion chamber, right? and then it gets burnt in there as well. So that requires more accuracy to do that? Uh, it requires, yes, the, the technology is a little different, but yeah, you're still, you know, the engines are tuned to operate at a certain air fuel ratio, so that yeah. has to be maintained regardless of the technology that you use, right? But definitely there's a lot more technology So, so modern here. ECUs now allow us to be able to skip that port step, right? Is that the, is that the concept? That right. We would call it superior because there, there tend to be, uh, these engines burn uh, fuel more efficiently. So what you, we have two cutaways here, two engines. These are real engines. Uh, and what you see here, this is a poor fuel injected engine, right? So here you have 
the inlet port. So air will come in this way. You got your total charger, you got air here, and you got the fuel injector here. So the air and, and the fuel mix in the port, right? And then this valve opens, the fuel air mixture comes in, and then you got that piston as you saw in the engine outside, compresses that mixture. The spark plug fires, you get combustion, pushes the piston down, you get your power stroke, and then here will be the exhaust, exhaust gases. Right? So, um, and then downstream here, you're gonna have a catalytic converter, and obviously that's gonna take care of any sort of emissions. So these, these engines right now are pretty efficient. So these valves, because of the exposure to fuel, now, it is good to have fuel touching the valves because it helps clean them. But if the fuel that you use is not good, it's low quality, you will still get deposits. So this valve here is showing deposits on it versus that one. And now these valves come from an engine test, which run for about 10,000 miles. And you then pull the valves and look at them. So if you then can uh, prevent, obviously, the pauses from forming, that's going to help the engine uh, perform better. Because even that, you say, well, OK, it's inside the engine. Do I worry? Yes, because they can, they can continue to build up. Uh, they can also um, obviously start impacting not only the air fuel ratio, but sometimes depending on the, the structure, what those deposits look like, they can start also impacting how the fuel air mixture tumbles inside a combustion chamber. And when I say, you know, tumble and swirl, this is something that the OEMs spend a lot of time developing and they do a lot of computer simulations about how is that fuel you know, going to tumble and swirl inside the combustion chamber so that when it ignites, it burns completely, basically. That's, that's the concept. So if you move the camera over to this side, this is the side that was uh, the valve that comes out of the test with Shell V-Power. Similar Shelby mileage. Power. Exact same mileage, yes. So these are... Same engine type? It's the same engine, it's a test engine, so okay. it's a standard. This is... It's the it's only thing that changes is the fuel. The only thing that changes is the fuel, exactly. Mm -hmm. it, it, so it's it a direct is, comparison. It is done in a standard engine following a standard uh, ASTM test method. Okay, so, so you wanted to know a little bit more about Octane. Yes. And uh, I can tell you, uh, the Octane is determined by the fuel grade. So when you, go to the, when you go to the pump, to the gas stations, you will see their regular, mid-grade, and premium, right? So sure. regular is 87 octane. Generally, and right. Then generally, yep. and then the premium can vary between 91 and 93 octane across the country. So uh, the octane is defined by the uh, anti-knock index in the US. It's different from Europe. So if you go to Europe and you see AKI, anti-knock index. Okay, got anti it. Anti-knock index, which yeah. is the AKI. Which yeah. That's RON plus MON divided by two. RON plus MON. So yeah. RON so what's is wrong? the research octane number. Okay. MON is the motor octane number, and okay. you divide that by two. So basically, is is the conditions that you test the? It's all done through engine testing. The conditions at which you, you test the engine are different for both. So the road, the the more, motor octane number is run at much uh, stringent conditions, so much more uh, you know temp higher temperatures, pressures, and so on. So when you then combine these two, you get what we call the anti-knock index, and that's what you see at the pumps here in the United States. So AKI and, uh, equals RON plus MON divided by two. Divided by two. Got it. When you go to Germany or you go to uh, England or you Japan, go to Japan. Yeah. In the Netherlands, Germany, England, in Europe in general, yeah. what you see there is the RON. So at the pump, you know, when they tell you 98 octane, it's mm -hmm. not 98 AKI, it's 98 RON. Mm -hmm. okay. So a 93 AKI here in North America is equivalent to a 98 RON in Europe. Because okay? we often hear people say, well, why isn't our octane as high as it is in Europe? But I go, well, actually, it's almost the same. It's just that we use different terminology for it, you know, and, and people don't normally understand it's wrong, that's more divided by two. 
What about what about additive technology? Are they generally rather similar? Or is there differences between your know, different country to country? Additive technology for for what? Like for gasoline for yes. you say Germany versus versus that Japan. Japan meet the right. Other countries' demand is that Yeah, I mean the base fuel meets the standard specs everywhere locally. You mm -hmm. know, uh, but then the additive technology can vary. Mm -hmm. So, for example, our uh, Shell V Power products all over the world, even though they deliver similar benefits, the additive technology is different. Mm -hmm. So, it's not exactly the same. Okay. That's what we get here. But the gasoline at, at, at gas station A and B, I mean, how is that, is the, 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 the standard of octane, is that pretty, pretty strict, pretty, uh, pretty reliable? Like if I go to a, you know, a big convenience store gas station or a big box store gas station versus, so is the octane re rating reliable? Yeah, is I, mean, the I, I can't tell you about, others you know competitors and things mm -hmm. like that but but i can tell you about our fuels are the fuels that we sell or our stations obviously you know we have quality controls in place uh we make sure that you know the fuels uh, are you always have to have you know a certificate of analysis to make sure that the fuel complies with the specs and all the specifications in the u.s and in most parts of the world are sort of minimum numbers so for example uh, when you see AKI 87, that's the minimum. Mm. So that's the minimum that is allowed by the law, right? But you can have some higher obtained rating sometimes, and it's not going to be significantly higher, but it, there's a variation, right? If you have a vehicle that is premium required, right? Premium required, you should use premium with that vehicle. Sure. You should not mess about using regular, you know, using non-premium because that vehicle is designed to deliver the best performance with the premium fuel. Right, it'll run, it'll run leaner, and right. they'll, you know, they'll pull timing and stuff yeah. in order to. Now you have all the vehicles here in North America that are premium recommended but not required. Yep. Now that is confusing for people. You say, okay, people focus and say, oh, not required. They don't focus on the recommended. Yeah. Right? We say, oh, it's recommended, but it's not required, so that means I can run on anything, I can do regular, which is cheaper, right? right. Yeah. And that is true, but what happens is that engine is not going to get to deliver the best performance. Because if you put the premium fuel, and obviously the more you use it, the, the better for the engine. The engine will be actually adapted to that fuel and be able to provide you know, the performance that it was designed to provide now. No sensors are available in all vehicles nowadays, right? Uh, so what, what happens when you put a lower octane fuel into a vehicle that could use a premium? It'll inject more fuel, wouldn't it, typically? Right. eventually, yeah. but, but also the NOx sensor is preventing the, the vehicle from delivering audible knock. So you will not hear it, but it's still happening. Mm. You just don't perceive it. But the engine is still knocking, just the knock sensor is, is preventing you from noticing. But what will happen then is that the vehicle is not really working efficiently. Mm -hmm. It's totally always compensating, you know, knocking and the engine management system is sending signals and then the knock sensor acts on it and says, okay, you don't hear it. Uh, but eventually you're not gonna get the best performance out of that vehicle. So help us understand uh, 87 versus 93. Is 93 more combustible? Is it is it is it create a uh, more violent chemical reaction or a combustibility reaction? Well, and how does it, it? Yeah, it's just the and the base fuel carries that characteristic already. So it's how you actually combine components at the refinery to create those blends. So an 87 versus a, a 91, 93, you're going to have different components in there. Potentially, you could have lighter components in the in the premium fuel uh -huh. that would burn definitely quicker or more volatile. So yes, got it. Okay. And the corrosion test is is something that a lot of people are not very familiar with. But what you do is you take a spindle like one of these guys, and you get a little cap, right? We here at the lab we call it a beaker, <laughs> and you put gasoline in there. And then you add a contaminant. A lot of the times for the test procedure is uh, you could add some distilled water or water, just plain water, or you could add other things too if you want to. You could add salt water or you know, 
and then what it is is that you leave the spindle in that cup for about um, four hours or so. You let it sit there. And then you pull it out and look at it. And you see how much corrosion has taken place on the surface. And you will say, wow, four hours? That's it? Yes, that's it, four hours. It's very quick. And you can see here, so this is an older premium fuel that was tested. This is a new spindle in the middle, so just so you see the comparison. And this is the outcome of the test with the Shelby Power solution there. I've always wanted one since the last time. After four hours of sugar fest, and I got to drive my bird. Just four hours one. of the test duration. One, and, 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 and this decent is decent condition, uh, but it's, it's okay because it'll the make the power side. And here we got dual injection, so you have a direct injection and poor fuel injection. Okay, so these work simultaneously. Uh, in the engine. You have the possibility to run the engine uh, when you need more power, right? The, your direct injection kicks in. Okay. That's kind of how it works. Mm -hmm. But you do have also the pore fuel injection that would be helping keep these valves clean, right? If you use the right fuel, obviously. <laughs> Is that the main purpose of dual injectors? Yeah, it's, it's a way to actually manage how you then deliver more power to the engine uh, with the same engine, with the same sort of, yeah. What I always tell people is that wear and friction are like first cousins, right? They're related, but they're not the same, okay? So I'll explain. And they tend to affect the same sort of parts in the engine. So this is a piston we saw outside there, the engine with the four cylinders and the six cylinder, right? Well, this piston has piston rings right up at the top here. So, and these are examples of these this rings, right? So you have the oil ring, and then you have the top piston ring, which is the compression ring. So, so the job of that top piston ring is to keep the compression in the engine. But you see it's flexible, right? So it moves, so as the piston is moving up and down at 3,000 revolutions per minute, you got a lot of flexibility in there, but you don't have a lot of room, okay? So what tends to happen is that in order to keep that compression, this top piston ring tends to be oil starved or starved of oil, right? So this is exactly where wear can happen, uh, right up at that top piston ring. But at the same time, depending on obviously how much uh, friction you have in there to start with, you're gonna probably end up with a lot of wear, right? Mm -hmm. So if you can minimize friction, you automatically helping also minimize so where is a result of friction where would be a result of friction uh, and, and friction is really loss of energy in the engine so things get hot right mm -hmm. and you start losing energy that way where is more loss of metal when wear takes place you are actually losing something like metal in there right so yeah that can have eventually with time you know this is something that happens over time over a long time you can have I mean it is an it's inevitable but you can minimize right. you can minimize yeah through so, so the top piston ring the fuel the additive to the fuel is what yeah, can help with the oil starvation of that because exactly. hopefully oil's not getting to that third no, ring it shouldn't right get, it shouldn't get in there but the fuel is adding you know that sort of protection around the, the cylinder wall and the top layer yes where the, where the top piston ring is and I mean, this display here uh, is actually um, a display that comes out of a real engine test that we did. We radar labeled the, uh, the fuel, and then we were able to trace uh, all throughout the, the, the engine cycle as the engine was operating, how wear was taking place. So you see up here, you know, you can already see the top of the piston, you know, it's already quite a lot of scars there. But also inside the cylinder wall, you see the cylinder liner here has a lot of scratches. And you see this top bit here? Every time the piston will go up there and, and you, can, you can actually see evidence of that kind of wear. And mm. this side is, is much, much cleaner. Mm. You don't see anything there. Interesting. I should have been a mechanical engineer. It would have been way better. Yes. <laughs> and we do, um, you know, the wear test where we actually take one of these, these are the real specimens. So we take a little ball bearing, if I can grab one now, ball bearing and a disc. And then we have a, a reservoir where we put that and uh, we add a drop of fuel 
mm -hmm. on the disc and then the ball bearing we exert pressure on the disc and there's an os this oscillates there for about 75 minutes and it rubs against the two rub against each other then we look at that ball bearing how much is worn and we have to do that under a microscope this is it's really hard to see but uh, we then be. produce these micro uh, ball bearings just for you to that's hard so we were just talking about how fuel is delivered and that is so 93 would come in a separate tanker Definitely. and deliver direct to a gas station into a separate tank well, that's a question I had what about you you hear about uh, you know your dad will always tell you don't get gas when they just filled up the tank because oh, it yes. stirs up stuff is there any validity to that what is your take yeah, on that it, it depends but let me tell you a little bit before about the, the tanker the tanker trucks Sometimes you see the, the hose goes into the premium tank and then they take the same hose and put it into the regular tank. Yeah. Okay, what it is, it's not the same fuel, but tanker trucks have compartments inside. Mm. Okay. So when you see a tanker arriving at a gas station, it could, have, it could have two or three compartments in there. Got and it. Each compartment has a different fuel in it. Okay. So the driver is trained to know exactly, you know, and he has a, the, he, he has to key in a, a particular number that would allow the premium fuel to be released into the premium tank. Mm. So there's a lot of controls over that. Uh, this information about, you know, don't, don't fill up when you're, well. Uh, what tends to happen when you deliver fuel to a tank, depending on how empty that tank is, and how that station has maintained those tanks, okay? underground tanks I'm talking about, uh, you could have some water in there or certain things that get into tanks uh, and that's normal mm -hmm. but what happens is the fuel has to be able to then settle quite quickly so everything settles down to the bottom of the tank that's where the pump is right? and the then bottom. when you come and get your fuel you're gonna get fuel that has nothing in there obviously everything anything that could be in that tank settles down to the bottom but so not all gas stations are created equally exactly exactly man that's a tricky one not all gas stations are created that stresses me out yes it's like going to the bar so you want to go to a new a beer one and they don't clean the beer line not necessarily yeah. new ones i mean it, it really you know you you would see activity at certain stations you know and, and we monitor our stations yeah across the entire country you know collecting samples and we have a way of tracing you know where our fuel whether it is our fuel or not uh, so what are some cues? What, would, what do you look for? Because you're very particular about where you get your gas. What are yeah. some cues? Are you looking for like clean bathrooms? Are you looking well, for a, you <laughs> know? See, everything comes together, right? Everything comes together. So if you think about, you know, you visit a friend and, you know, the house is a complete mess and you walk in and you have stuff everywhere. It's a microcosm of... Do you think of, the bathroom is going to be clean? It right. could be. It could be, but it Unlikely. could be even messier, right? Because that's not part of the house that you open to everybody, right? If, if, so it's the same everywhere you go for service. You know, if you walk into a station and you see that it's, ah, oh, I stepped on this mess here, now my shoe is all messed up. And it, so immediately gives you, you know, uh, there's a lot of little cues that will tell you that's probably not the best quality mm. because, you know, they're not going to be as picky. Right. And they in the U.S., um, all the stations are run by wholesalers, okay? So Shell really basically sells the fuel to them. They mm -hmm. carry our brand, obviously, and they have to adhere to a number of things that we stipulate for them to have the brand and to have, you know, Shell fuels at the station. Interesting. Yeah, but it's really, at the end of the day, you know, up to each individual wholesaler how they run it. And if you happen to see anything that you think, oh my gosh, this is crazy here, this is Shell Station, let us know. Because we go and check them out. You know, close to where I live, there was a station. Every time I went, I could see they acted outside. It was all old, kind of almost rusty. And I kept going in there and say, hey, you need to change that back then. And he would look at me. <laughs> and every time I went, I know three times, and I said, that's it, had enough. So I contacted people internally here. Immediately I said, hey, look, there's the station, gave them the address and everything. It's, it's disgraceful just to see just the logo so misused, right? And then I said, I don't get any confidence that these guys are doing their business correctly. Right. 
So immediately they sent the territory manager, went there, had a chat with them, started checking them out. There were some issues there. Mm -hmm. So they were able to correct it, you know. But so the pump pulls fuel, uh, I'm assuming there's some filtration as well, wouldn't there? Yes. Some inline filters? Every single dispenser has a filter. Right. So there's always a last line of defense, right? Right. You know, we do a lot of work to make sure the fuel quality is up to, you know, top notch, but how do they how do they separate water, you know, from from the fuel? Is well, there you have to prevent the water from getting in there in the first place. Mm -hmm. So that's what we really aim for, right? Yeah. So we do check our tanks always with uh, what you call the water finding paste and make sure that you know you mm -hmm. don't have obviously yeah. uh, water in the tanks. And then you know they, if there is water in the tanks, they have to pump it up. Mm. You know, they have to get that water out of there. Now, if you have a filter, the filter, depending on the type of filter, is not going to get water out of there. Mm. You know, unless you have um, filters that use water absorbing material. And there are some of those out there. Fourth generation of uh, dual field technology that we have developed here ourselves. So we've taken the engine and we, the engine rail and split it in half. So you have half of the engine, three cylinders run on the Shelby Power Natural Plus premium gasoline fuel and the other three run on a, another premium, right? So uh, what we have in there is that we have, uh, we've taken the intake manifold out and we have a boroscope that allows us to look inside the engine. So you can see basically the top of the valves and uh, this truck was run uh, about 4,000 miles. So there's two fuel lines, right, that deliver the fuel into the engine. And the engine runs on the two fields simultaneously. Okay? We don't need to, uh, sometimes we get people that say, how can you do that? Is you have two fields running at the same time. So basically three cylinders on one field and the other three on the other field. So the idea here is as a demonstration tool, we can then talk about how the two sides compare because you're running them at exact same conditions. Okay, so the, so, so the intake thought, manifold's removed, and then you're just sticking a boroscope down into the cylinder. Yes. And so we're going to be looking at the top of the valve, the yes. top of the intake valve? The top of the intake valve. Now, I told you earlier, this, this Raptor has a dual injection technology. Port and direct injection. So it's right. port and direct and injection. Direct. But what we're going to see here is more uh, sort of the, the port side. Okay. So this is a real camera. Hopefully you can see yourselves there. Yeah. Right? It's a, it's a fancy little camera. So I'm going to put this. It's a boroscope. You may have, I don't know if you have access to one of these guys, but not a cheap tool, right? And this is going to travel all the way down to finding the top of the valve. And then we're going to move this around until we, we see. Showing. This is the other side. This is, this is the other side. Until we see. Now here you can visualize a little more. Yeah. So the deposit is right here. Yeah, here's the... Right? And that's the valve stem. Yeah. Yeah. Now, like I said earlier, this is like 4,000 miles. Okay? It's not a lot of miles at all. And it already had that much build -up. It already had that build up. Okay. So it already happened at that. I want to know what other fuel this is, but I don't think she's going to tell us. No, uh, she won't. <laughs> we have to fight the glare. It's very glary in yeah. Texas. Yeah, it's much easier there. to see it in person yeah. than the camera. That's yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so if we take this now and put it in the Shelby power side. So is that carbon? Yes. Is that what, what the resulting, you know? Yeah, that's every time you, you burn fuel, you produce carbon. And you also produce water. There it is. So that's the top of the valve. And you see the side there. Let me move it up a little bit and then you can see. See the grain in the metal, you know, and it's shining there. It's shining because of the camera has a light at the end. Interesting. I don't think you would expect the this to be exponential, right? So if you, as you went to 8 and 12 and 100,000 miles that once... I would think that once you have a porous deposited, right. it would tend to deposit more Definitely. rapid in a more rapid pace, right? Definitely. Yeah. But the good news is if you switch to V power, you will start removing those deposits. Mm. Right. You set up to 70% with the first Yeah, feet. exactly. Up to 70% with the first So you can backtrack, essentially. 
So, <laughs> tell me about one of the things I don't understand, which means there's probably other people too. So if crude comes out of the ground, then what? How do we get, like, what? Oh, okay, how do we okay, get okay, to okay. this yeah, step? So keeping it very simple. So crude comes out of the ground, and as the name suggests, it's a crude uh, substance, right? So yeah. basically, it can be, depending on where it comes from, it can be a little heavy, it can be a little lighter. Think about it like uh, like really strong coffee, okay? And then what do we do? We take it to the refineries, and at the refineries, we process it. What does that mean? Technically, it means we boil it. We okay. literally boil off different components. So as you're boiling this mixture, did you do any chemistry? Yeah. Sure, yeah. So what you do is you start separating out things, right? right. So components in the crude oil, they boil, they separate out at different boiling ranges. So you have a boiling range for real light things that comes out right up at the top. You have, as you go down the, the column, imagine it's a column, right? It's a column okay. that you, and the crude is being split into different fractions. So lighter components until you get to the bottom of that column is the heavier stuff. The stuff that you can't really boil out anything more out of that. Okay. Right? And that's how you get. So you got, you know, lighter components. Gasoline is one of the top ones. Okay. You have, you know, jet fuel, then you have your diesel fuel, and then you come down to the heavier bits. Hmm. And heavier would be generally lubrication stuff? The heavy, yeah, you could have some components like that, or you have uh, heavy fuel oil, for example, you know, things that you use for, for ships and marine. How, how much waste is in, let's say, a barrel of crude? Is there a percentage of waste? Or do uh, they use it? Not very much, you know. A lot of it gets used, yeah. And how do they boil it? I mean, it's combustible. How does it not... How does well, it... think about it. I mean, it is, it is a... a a comp it is something that comes out of the ground that you can work with, mm -hmm. right? And of course, it's not going to be burned just like that. You know, it it's goes through the process of a distillation column that can handle the sort of type of boiling of that material and getting the components out of it in a safe manner. So can you're you, not going to, you know, just burn the whole can thing. Can you get me into that tour? I want to see that done. Oh, that's a tour of the refinery, yeah. But you know, when you go to a refinery, it's really hard. You will see the big column. But you're not... But you don't see anything. Yeah. You know what I mean? Somebody will tell you, well, you see the column there, and then the top is going to be your life fraction, then it's going to be gasoline. The same thing I'm telling you, but you will see the column, but you don't see anything happening inside. Yeah. Now, they are probably online. You can find some information that talks about, you know, how crude is processed, you know, coming out of the ground. We do have, but we don't have it here right now, but we could bring it next time, like a little display that shows, you know, the different fractions and what they look like. Yeah. So, you know, you got the really dark stuff that stays at the bottom until you get to the lighter components, which are lighter and also brighter color, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Got it. All right, so, you know, I find this stuff fascinating. Uh, I think it was worth getting on a plane for, a, you know, an hour and a half meeting with, uh, with a chemical engineer uh, and learning about uh, fuel. Uh, it, it answered some questions for me uh, about, about why. Um, and and, uh, and I, I think there's still more information that I'd like to know specifically about refining the refinement process, uh, the detail of it, you know, getting, getting sucked out of the ground, you know, from start to finish. How does this, how does it end up? Uh, and I think I'm going to have a difficult time uh, in that a lot of that, a lot of the additives and things that are that are placed in gasoline is very, um, very proprietary, obviously very secretive, I'm sure. Uh, but I still want to know. You know, I'm always going to ask those questions. Uh, and you know, one of the things that uh, that that I, I'm un been uncertain of from the beginning is is partnering with anybody or any kind of sponsorship or anything like that. So I want you to know that you know if Sheldon didn't pay me for this in fact. I'm such a snob. I bought my own darn plane tickets to go out there uh, and 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 view the you know, the, the technology and, and learn about learn about the fuel. Uh, so you know, who knows? Maybe someday um, Shell would be the uh, the title sponsor of the Dialed In podcast or something like that. I don't know how that would work. Um, but anyway, 
interesting. I was uh, honored to be invited and, uh, and uh, certainly humbled that uh, Serena spent the time. Uh, she had actually watched some of our videos beforehand, which is kind of cool. Uh, and uh, and hopefully uh, we continue to I uh, continue to get access to things like this to chase the answers to some of the questions that I have so thanks for watching uh, stay tuned for uh, for more crazy I'm, I'm sure I'll come up with more of it anyway catch you on the next one mm -hmm.